Statistical Process Control, SPC, and Statistical Quality Control, SQC. Virtually every manufacturing industry in North America and throughout the world practice SPC and SQC in their processes. There are different names that you'll hear. You'll hear the term ISO 9000, 14000. You may have heard QS. You may hear TQM, Total Quality Management. But all of these packages contain quality tools that are presented in this course. And it would behoove you to get familiar with these tools of quality management, quality control, and this will help you in your career. So give it your best. The first 10 pages of this chapter is taken largely from a training manual from the Chrysler Corporation with written permission. And so some of the examples are geared towards the automotive industry, but they certainly apply in the chemical processing industry as well, and I'll try and apply that as we go. Let's get some history of SPC. Many people think of the Japanese when they hear the words statistical process control. What most people don't know is that SPC was developed by an American, Dr. Schuert of Bell Labs in New Jersey, and he developed SPC in the 1920s. SPC was successfully used by the US military in World War II in the manufacture and distribution of armaments. Then after the war, statisticians tried to sell SPC to the US industries, but worldwide demand for American goods was so great at the time that businesses paid more attention to production than to quality improvement. In the early 1950s, Japanese industrialists desiring to get their post-war economy back on its feet invited American statisticians Dr. Edward Deming and Joseph Duran to Japan for assistance and the Japanese businesses learned and practiced SPC with success. In the early 1980s after Japanese imports notably automobiles and electronic goods had severely cut into North American markets the Ford Motor Company invited Dr. Deming back to the US to learn SPC. Take a look at these graphs. I appreciate it's dated but it's still valid its, its history. Here on the y-axis we have the world production share of products as a percentage uh, over time on the x-axis and you can see that US and Canada North America steady decline from the 50s through the 80s on the other hand the Japanese share of world production was markedly increasing and has continued in that trend since Now, again as I present this bear in mind that this is presented by a North American automotive industry. From 1950 to 1990 it shows quality, quality competition and this reads that North American automotive quality was gradually increasing and improving from 1950 to 1990 but it's showing the Japanese quality as improving dramatically in that time period and surpassing that of North American vehicles. This next graph is actual data, it's not a bias interpretation, it's real data from a 1977 Hertz auto rental company a repair per hundred vehicles, that's frequency of repairs per hundred vehicles based on millions of passenger miles repairs of North American vehicles were up to seven times as frequent as Japanese vehicles for the first 12,000 miles. Since the 80s most other North American industries have followed suit and likewise now practice SBC. In my experience in chemical industry, and I worked there 17 years, in the early 90s, Ford Motor Company, Chrysler, Eldorado Nuclear, other companies came on board to us and said, show us how you're practicing SBC. So they downloaded this to all their suppliers. It's in chemical industry as well as the automotive industry. Page 4, we have the goals of SPC in industry. Increased quality. Yeah, that's a good goal. But the idea is that we improve the manufacturing process. Increased productivity. 
another good goal, but, but how? Well, catching tool wear and other maintenance needs before non-conforming product is made. We can apply that in the lab. We can apply it in the chemical industry. You know, clean the distillation column before it starts having poor separation, before it starts producing bad product. Reduce cost by increasing uptime and reducing scrap and we work. We are to be competitive in a global economy. All auto manufacturers and all chemical manufacturers require SPC of their suppliers because it is a proven tool for continuous process improvement. And virtually all manufacturing industries have published quality policies stating their commitment to it from the top level, like the one you see here. The then president of the Chrysler Corporation Lee Iacocca wrote a quality statement such as this one, and I'm not going to read it to you, but it basically says that from the top level down, the corporation is committed to quality. Now, that's a statement. Is it, in fact, carried out in practice? That's a different question. But at least we're recognizing that it is important. So what are the benefits of SPC? Well, it gives you, the worker, better control of the process. It can become a source of pride in a job well done. Some people find that rewarding. It lends to credibility to your requests for changes or repairs to your equipment. I can speak to that. If you go to your boss and say, we need to replace this compressor or we need this instrument replaced or repaired, they can just say, you're not doing it properly. Go back and do it again. I've experienced that. On the other hand, if you can show them statistically that you've carried out proper practices and you've repeatedly got problems, it carries a lot more weight. So what is quality? Well, quality means producing goods and services that satisfy the customer's needs or expectations. And it means conformance to a target rather than just being within tolerance. Important distinction that we'll discuss later on. So we're going to use statistics, and that is a means of collecting and analyzing numeric data to understand how something works. For example, unemployment in Ontario dropped from 11.2 to 10.6 percent this year, so it's a measure of the strength of the economy. We use a lot of sampling in industry, and sampling involves measuring some of the parts to determine how well all the parts are being made. Sampling is done in every plant. Now in chemical industry, it may be a little different than in automotive industry. In the automotive industry, they might measure five parts every two hours. In the chemical industry, we take samples from the process, production, every couple hours. But then we also measure the product before the product is shipped. And for example, we have a storage tank with 10,000 pounds of hydrofluoric acid in it, and that tank is put on circulation for six or eight hours, and so that when we get a sample, we feel it's representative of the entire production for a given time period. So what are the problems with just sampling to control a process? Sampling alone is not effective as a means of controlling the process for the following reasons. Normally, we do not carry out 100% inspection. We don't measure every piece produced to filter out bad parts. Now, in the chemical industry, you could argue, well, we actually do that. Every time we have a storage tank, 10,000 pounds of HF, it's ready to be shipped. We put it on circulation for eight hours, and we take a sample, and that represents 100% of what's going to be shipped, so that's valid. But within the process itself, we only take samples every two hours. And two hours is a long time to go between samples. Perhaps we should have a continuous analyzer installed that could measure continuously, but those are still difficult. So if sometimes we can, often we can't. Even if we did attempt 100% inspection, fatigue and boredom cause people to miss non-conforming product. 100% inspection is time-consuming. It does not improve the quality of the process. It does not reduce scrap. If I have to reprocess 10,000 pounds of acid because the sulfur dioxide is too high and I have to redistill it, that's a tremendous waste of company resources and time. It's costly. Reworking involves labor time, machine time, and more wear to the process.
This last point is quite important. Many parts that pass inspection may only be barely within specification limits rather than close to the target specification. We'll come back to this. Let's distinguish between detection versus prevention. Use a simple illustration from your automobile. Inspection only detects problems. It doesn't prevent them. So consider the idiot light on your car. When the oil light comes on, it says that your oil pressure is low and you're in trouble and you better pull over fast because you may damage your engine because your oil pressure is low. That's detection. A better system is prevention. You have not an idiot light but an oil pressure gauge that shows the pressure of the oil pump and it varies with time and you'll have a high range and a low range and a normal range and you'll be able to see when a problem is approaching gradually you can correct it ahead of time. Take action before damage occurs. The difference between detection and prevention is illustrated in these flow diagrams. In a defect detection system we have our process making material. It goes to inspection. If it's bad it may have to be scrapped or if it can be reworked it's sent back and reprocessed. We have a loop here and then whatever passes inspection goes to the customer. Well defect detection does not prevent the production of non-conforming product to start with. This is costly. It makes a company non-competitive. By comparison, a defect prevention system looks like this. Material comes into our process. It's continually inspected with SPC. The data is analyzed and improvements are made to the process in real time and then ideally there's no bad material made and it all goes to the customer. Now this is somewhat idealized, as you'll see, but it's certainly a better system than defect detection. So SPC provides immediate feedback on the performance of the process, so adjustments or improvements can be made before non-conforming parts are made. You'll see that some of our quality tools we're going to use don't necessarily give immediate detection, but certainly much quicker than you would get simply by inspection most important aspect of quality control is variation. Uh, variation, no two things are exactly alike. Everything has variation in it, such as hair color, hair length, height, weight, and so on. Uh, there's variations in our process. We have temperature changes, we have humidity changes, and so on. Now within the process specifically, there's a list here that more or less applies to the chemical industry. We have MMMMEP. Let's try and fit these. Machinery. Every machine is subject to vibration, play, tool wear, the absorbance output of an atomic absorption spectrometer or a spectrometer visible or UV is continuously fluctuating at the low end. There's, there's always some variation. Materials have an effect upon variation in the process. This mentions steel hardness, but for us, our raw materials that we're using. For example, we used in one of our processes calcium fluoride called fluorospar. We got it from Spain, Morocco, China, and southern U.S. Different sources had different quantities of arsenic and phosphorus, which had to be removed and required a different distillation process. The methods of production affect variation. If we increase production rates, we can make more product, but often distillation and separation suffers. Intervals between maintenance and lubrication, intervals between servicing or instruments. All spectrophotometers differ slightly. Some have variation, some have more than others. The environment affects variation. Heat causes expansion. I'll give you an example. We measured arsenic in hydrofluoric acid by converting it to arsine, ASH3 gas. By adding zinc and an acid, it reduced arsenic to arsine. It came off as a gas. It was absorbed through a liquid scrubber. And it turned this liquid solution from yellow to red. And we measured the optical density in a spectrophotometer and measured the concentration. By using SPC and plotting our data over a period of more than a year, we noticed that in the wintertime, the arsenic levels were always higher in our HF than in the summertime. 
often came to realize that because the temperature in the lab was warmer in the summer, the gas bubbled off more quickly, had less time to absorb in the scrubber, and we got a lower optical density. It wasn't as dark red, and we measured lower HF. In the winter time, when it was cooler in the lab, the arsine bubbled off slower, had more time to absorb, and we always measured higher level of HF. This was an error that we would never have noticed had we not plotted our data over a long period of time using an SPC method. People affect variation. Different operators operate differently. Different lab techs analyze differently. So there are many sources of variation in the process. Regardless of the source, there are two basic divisions that are very important and you need to get a hold of this. Common cause versus special cause variation. A common cause variation, they are normal fluctuations or changes that occur in the process. Vibration, temperature, instrument wear, Common cause variations, sometimes called random variations, are due to chance and they're always going to be present. They can never be totally eliminated. In the lingo of statistics, common cause variation is called random variation. It's also called indeterminate error. Aside from common cause variations, we have special causes of variations, and these are also called assignable causes of variations due to special unnatural causes, machine failure, electrical failure, some instrument out of calibration, get a power dip, incorrect calibration or setup of the instrument, a standard improperly prepared, an error in pipetting or transferring. Right? Now these are not always present and they can be eliminated. In the lingo of statistics, special cause variation are called determinate errors or systematic errors. So back to our pressure gauge illustration. The oil pressure gauge on your car shows the difference between common cause and special cause variation. So the oil pressure will normally vary during driving. When you speed up or slow down, the oil pressure will change somewhat within a normal range. But if it suddenly falls below the normal range, that would be an assignable special cause of variation as opposed to normal or random variation. Another important distinction is the difference between tolerance and target. So looking at this first illustration, if the customer says that the specification for calcium chloride liquor is 42 percent plus or minus 1 percent, that means that the lower specification limit, LSL, is 41 percent. He won't accept anything below 41 and the upper specification limit is 43%, he won't accept anything above 43%. That's the tolerance between 41 and 43%. It's a 2% tolerance limit. The target specification is 42.0%, represented by position C. So tolerance is the distance between the customer's upper and lower specification limits, USL minus LSL. 43 minus 41 is 2% in this case. The tolerance mentality says that the product is okay anytime it falls anywhere within the specification. The product is just as good if it's at 42.8 compared to 42. Or 41.5 is just as good as 42. That's goalpost mentality. This thinking does not fit with SPC. Here's the SPC take on this. Here's our target. Here's our tolerance. We still have those. But notice this curved line. SPC thinking says that even a slight difference between the dimension of a part or concentration of a product and the target has some loss. So parts at C are exactly on target and have no loss. 42.0, that's exactly what the customer wants, that's what we want to produce. Parts at B have some loss in quality. 42.3 is not as good and parts at A have significant loss in quality. 42.5% is not nearly as good as 42. Now, that may be radical thinking for some production managers, but that is the thinking of SPC. Let me illustrate again with a real example. Less variation is higher quality. A company had TVs manufactured to the same specifications at two plants, one in Japan and one in California. 
Now, although the manufacturing location was not marked on the sets, customers repeatedly chose the Japanese sets when sold alongside the American-made sets. An investigation showed that the color density was critical for customers because this is what gave the picture a lifelike appearance. So here's the color density of US made sets on the left versus the color density of Japanese made sets. Here's the LSL and USL. In both cases all the sets were within specification or they wouldn't have been shipped, right? The US made sets were using up all the specification range while the Japanese sets were clustered near the target value for a color density. Because there was less variation from the target value, the Japanese plant had a much higher number of excellent sets and fewer fair sets compared to the U.S. plant. Less variation means higher quality. This is an excellent study and the video for it is posted on Blackboard. I give you the YouTube link. It's well worth watching. A North American automaker found that there were fewer complaints on transmissions manufactured by a Japanese subcontractor than those built in their own U.S. Midwest plant. This was a Ford plant, Ford Batavia in Ohio. So these were transmissions that were built in Japan and in the U.S. and they were, they were all installed in a Ford vehicle. So they were all made to Ford specifications. It's just the Japanese made them a little bit better. Well, actually, a lot better. Both the U.S. and the Japanese transmission parts were all within specifications, but the Japanese parts had much less variation. The Japanese transmissions had greater uniformity of parts. Measurements showed that the U.S. parts occupied 70% of the total specification range, while the Japanese parts occupied only 27% of the total specification range. How often do you want to replace your transmission? It's well worth watching that video. Keep in mind it's made, produced, and distributed by the Ford Motor Company. So who is responsible for quality? Well, if it's special cause variation, this can usually be corrected by the operator, by the lab tech. You can recalibrate the instrument. You can make up new standards. If the GC column is dirty and you're getting ghost peaks, then bake the column. This can be corrected on the floor at the time. But the reduction of common cause variation, instrument variation, the instrument is aging, it's unreliable. This is management's responsibility and it's up to them to service or replace the instrument. Virtually all quality experts agree that about 85% of variation in the process is common cause and not fixable by the operator. Only about 15% of variation in a process is due to special cause and is fixable by the operator. On page 10 we have Deming's 14 points. 14 points he believed to be necessary to obtain excellence within a corporation and these 14 points have gained wide acceptance and I'm certainly not going to read them to you except perhaps the first one create constancy of purpose towards improvement of product and service what this means is you don't just take a course put something in place and your job's done every day every hour you are continually putting data into a statistical management system and evaluating the state of the process and making continuous improvement it's never good enough you continually and forever make small changes to improve the process. So Deming's thinking is that management is responsible for improving the system. Systems are complex. Managers can't figure out everything on their own. Many times managers who like to micromanage, it's usually not very successful for several reasons unless the manager has come up through the ranks and has an intimate knowledge of the process most managers don't know the process that well that they can jump in and give specific direction it's also not very well received by the worker the worker needs to be empowered and to take pride in their work and then there's a level of trust that occurs and it does a lot to improve spirit and camaraderie within the organization it's much more successful problems can be divided into two sources. They're local, some workers, some instruments, some of the time that special cause, it's bias, it's determinate error, it's systematic error. 
and then there's system problems. They are continual, they are inherent in the process, they are called random or common cause or indeterminate. Managers first need to determine if a problem is local or system. And how do we do this? Well, we speak a common language. It's statistics. And statistics and SPC will help you identify which problems are local and which are system. And we'll show you that. So what are the goals of SPC then? We want to understand the process using statistics, eliminate special causes of variation, that's investigation and action, and then reduce common causes of variation and maintain a process that's in statistical control and has high process capability. And we'll show you exactly what these terms equate to in a statistical fashion in upcoming lectures. Page 11. Some of this will be old hat, some will be new. We have already defined statistics. What's the difference between SPC and SQC? Well, SPC, S is for statistics and C is for control, and P is for process. So basically you're using statistics to control the process, the manufacturing process, for example using statistics to control the operation of the distillation column, the evaporator, or whatever the case may be. So what's SQC? Using statistics to control the quality of the product. That's something that's often done in the lab by analysis of samples. Maybe you've heard the term quality assurance program. So what's assurance mean? Assurance is like confidence refers to the lab program that assures management, customers, government, etc. that the lab is proven and of known quality. And how does one demonstrate quality control and give confidence to the customers? Well, here's some examples. Include a standard of known concentration along with each batch of samples analyzed and plot this on a control chart. Calibrate instruments on a regular basis and retain proof of it. For every product shipment, retain samples that are properly labeled. That would include the name of the analyst, the date, the time, the method number, the instrument used, and these can be checked at a later date. Typically these are stored for about a year, and if there's a complaint, you can take it off the shelf and analyze it. And that assumes the sample is stable over that time period. D. Demonstrate prevention of falsification of data. You don't believe me. You say, what? No one would ever change a number. You darn right they would. So how do you do that? Well, one example is to run blind samples. So a blind sample is a sample of known concentration that is known by the boss but not known by the analyst, and it's included along with each batch. And so there's no way you can fudge the numbers. It is what it is. Another way to demonstrate prevention of falsification of data is to keep data recorded in bound notebooks. Really? Paper? Yeah, sometimes we still use paper, bound notebooks, not, not loose leaf, written in pen, so we can't rub the numbers out. It's human nature. I already described what a blind sample is. You know what accuracy is, right? Accuracy is the difference between the measured value and the true value, and precision is a measurement of repeatability. An analysis may yield precise results, repeatable, but be quite inaccurate. If your concentration of your stock was in error, you might be measuring 20 ppm repeatedly, but really the concentration was 10 ppm. You might have high repeatability, but be quite inaccurate. So a quantifying accuracy. The average x bar of several measurements, x sub i, is reported as a percentage of the true value t. So here's an example. An analyst began with zero concentration of analyte and added measured amounts of a known standard. The data and accuracy might be reported as follows. Sample 1, 20 milligrams added, 22 milligrams recovered or measured. Sample 2, 20 milligrams added, 20 milligrams recovered, and sample 3 the same, this time 24 milligrams recovered. The sum of the individuals 
66 divided by the number of samples. 66 over 3 gives us x bar. The sum of the individuals divided by the number of samples. 22 in this case. So the average percent recovery, that is the percent recovery based on the average, would be x bar, 22, divided by the true value of 20, times 100%. So 110% is the percent recovery. Percent recoveries are often calculated along with samples. Here's a second case. If the analyst repeated the procedure and obtained the following data, what is true about the accuracy and precision in the second set of data? Okay, so here again, 20 milligrams of calcium added three times. Here's the recoveries, 14, 21, 25. If you calculate the total, it's 60, right on the money. The number of samples is 3. So x bar is the sum of the individual values divided by number of samples. You see where this is going. 60 divided by 3 is 20. Put a decimal after that zero to indicate the zero is significant. The percent recovery would be x bar over the true value times 100 percent. Well that's 20 over 20 times 100. That's 1 times 100 is 100 percent. It's important to determine both the accuracy and the precision of a method. We haven't talked about precision yet. We will shortly. Page 12. Error, like accuracy, is determined with reference to a true value. An error can be called inaccuracy. In the previous example, one student obtained 110% recovery, so we could say the percentage error is plus 10%. The second student got a percent recovery of 100%, in which case the percentage error would be zero. Variation can also be termed instability or imprecision. We've already discussed the difference between special cause and common cause errors, but let's just drill down a little bit deeper. Sometimes special causes are broken down into three kinds, operational or personal errors or mistakes, if you will, instrument and reagent errors, and sometimes there's errors within the method. For example, mechanical loss of sample. Have you ever spilled some? How many times have we seen people not properly drain a pipette? Overwashing or, or underwashing a precipitate. If I wash it too long, I lose some of the sample. If I don't wash it enough, there may be impurities included in the yield calculation. Weighing warm samples on an analytical balance causes fluctuations in the balance. Letting a hydroscopic sample absorb moisture. Hmm, that's a problem. Color blindness interfering with the endpoint determination during a titration. These are examples of operational or personal errors. What about some instrument or reagent errors? If someone uses uncalibrated or improperly calibrated weights or balances or glassware or instruments, it could be a problem. More than I'd like to admit, I've seen people use beakers as volumetric glassware to make standards. Beakers have an imprecision of at least 5%. They should never be used as volumetric glassware. Using reagents with impurities or dirty glassware. Errors on the method can occur too. Perhaps a certain method doesn't allow enough time for a reaction to go to completion. Sometimes there are side reactions. And there may be a difference between the endpoint and the equivalence point. The indicator you choose might change color at a point that's not at equivalence point. I think we've already discussed common causes of error, including things like humidity and temperature changes. Let's get some practice here. Identify the following causes of variation as special or common. 
if a spectrophotometer's calibration is off, well then likely all of the readings will be off and they'll be biased. They'll either be high or low and that's an example of special cause. The spectrophotometer is unsteady. No, that's more like common error, plus or minus. Normal variation. Forgot to add one reagent to all samples and standards. Oops. That is definitely a special cause and it generally will cause all of your samples and standards to be either high or low. It is unusually humid during analysis. Well that one's maybe ambiguous. Humidity does change and that's common. If it's unusually humid you could say well okay that's a special cause today. I'd say both might be legitimate answers there. Hydroscopic samples are left out during analysis. Well that would be a personal error and that would be a special cause, right? Temperature gauge on distillation column is reading 5 degrees low. Again, a special cause. Sloppy analytical technique. Again, some discretion might apply here. Being sloppy might give rise to errors that are above and below the mean. In that sense, it might be common, but it is a personal error. I'm going to call it special. Natural variation in the reagents, certainly that's a common cause. And finally, percent recovery is a measure of what? It's a measure of accuracy. Page 13. Match the following terms. We have precision, variation, error, and accuracy. Match these up with imprecision, closeness to true value, repeatability, and inaccuracy. So take a minute, you can stop the video and then turn it back on and see the correct answers. So precision would be repeatability. Variation, well that would be the same as imprecision. Error, that would be the same as inaccuracy. And accuracy is closeness to the true value. We're going to discuss the normal distribution. Uh, you probably have had this before, but I'll do it anyway. A series of measurements taken over a period of time can be arranged according to the number of times each measurement occurs. And this arrangement is called a distribution or a histogram. For example, ball bearing production, another automotive example, but it's easy to visualize. A manufacturer produced ball bearings to a specification of 0 0.850 inches diameter plus or minus 0 0.04 inches. So the tolerance was the upper specification limit minus the lower specification limit. That would be 0 0.850 plus 0 0.04 is 0 0.854 minus 0 0.850 minus 0 0.04 is 0 0.846. So the total spread, or total tolerance, is 0, 0, 0.08 inches. When the ball bearings were arranged according to size, slots at each measurement between 0.846 and 0.854 were filled in random pattern as shown in the first figure. Looks kind of random, eh? So a few ball bearings arranged according to size form a random pattern. As many more were stacked, the bearings formed a pattern called a distribution as shown. And as more ball bearings are measured and arranged, a definite pattern emerges. When many ball bearings are measured and arranged, a bell-shaped pattern is seen. Looks like a bell, doesn't it? The outline is called a bell curve or normal curve. It has a normal distribution. The normal distribution of ball bearings indicates that the ball bearing process is operating with only common cause variation present, and the range of sizes of product is constant and thus predictable. This is mostly true. There are cases where you could have a special cause error taking place and the distribution is still normal. 
for example, the previous example I gave, if your calibration standard was off, then all of your sample readings will be biased either up or down in one direction. You could still have a normal distribution but be incorrect. So a, a normal distribution does not guarantee only common causes present, but if you have a non-normal distribution it implies you likely do have some special cause present. Let's see on the next page. Page 14. If, however, a special cause variation occurred during operation of the ball bearing process, such as over grinding, the size distribution would become non-normal as more smaller bearings were produced. So picture that initially the process was operating normally, but then due to some wear, we started producing smaller parts. You can appreciate that this would skew to the left and would be non-normal. So it, a non-normal distribution is a pretty good indication that some special cause is taking effect here. So the normal distribution, oh, many things in everyday life are normally distributed. This is approximately correct. Baseball batting averages, bowling averages, golf averages, people's weight and height normally distributed. We can determine a lot about the type and the source of variation in a process by the appearance of its distribution. So there's three things that are important about a distribution. First of all, its location or center. How does the average compare to the target? So let's take the green light colored line as the target, if you will. The center of it is the target and it has a normal distribution. In the first case on the left we see the red or darker line is offset. So its location or center is offset. This is off target. In the middle diagram we're looking at the spread or range. How wide is it compared to the tolerance? So the green line represents what we'd like to attain. A red line is correct in terms of its location or its average is correct, but there's too much variation. In the third case, let's look at the shape. Is the shape normal or not? So the red line here is definitely skewed to the left. There definitely appears to be some special cause of variation at work here. Page 15. When every part is measured, the arithmetic average, x bar, is called the population mean. It has a symbol mu. The majority of the values will be very close to the average, and few values will be far from the average. If the values are plotted on a frequency distribution, a plot of the number of times a value is obtained on the y-axis, versus the value itself, the plot will approximate that shown and is called the normal distribution, a Gaussian curve or a bell curve. Now I have one here, but the x-axis is not actual values, it's standard deviations from the mean. Really important that you're familiar with some of these values. So it turns out that 68% of the area under the normal distribution falls within plus or minus one standard deviation of the mean. Or in other words, 68% of the values that occur randomly will fall within plus or minus one standard deviation from the mean. Turns out that 95% of the area under the normal distribution, or 95% of the values that occur, will be within plus or minus 1.96 standard deviations from the mean. You say, what about two standard deviations? Well, that includes 95.5% of the area under the curve. If you want 99%, that's 2.58 standard deviations plus or minus from the mean, and plus or minus three standard deviations from the mean includes 99.7% of all the data. Now, this curve is asymptotic, so it never really reaches the x-axis. The most useful measure of dispersion is the standard deviation. And no doubt you've seen this before. The standard deviation is equal to the square root of the sum of the squares of the differences between individual values and the mean divided by the degrees of freedom, n minus 1 in this case. Now that's for a sample. 
So just think of a standard deviation as being the average deviation from the mean. Very useful in that sense. On average, how far are your points from the mean? Well, on average, they're about one standard deviation or two standard deviations and so on. When all the parts are measured, then the calculation becomes sigma, the population standard deviation, is equal to the root of the sum of the squares of the differences of individuals minus the average squared divided by n, where n is the number of samples. Now when the sample size n is large, typically greater than 30, both formulas give approximately the same result. So if I say that 68.3% of all the data lies within one sigma from the mean, think about this, it means that any single result has a 68% probability of being within plus or minus one standard deviation of the mean. If I say that 95.5% of all the data points fall within plus or minus two standard deviations of the mean, it means that any single result that you take has a 95.5% probability of being within plus or minus two standard deviations of the mean, and so on. Page 16, statistics for SPC. So variation is described in statistics by the standard deviation. If a large homogeneous sample is analyzed many times, say n times, all results will not be identical but will vary over a range. And the range is simply the highest value minus the lowest value. A lot of students don't appreciate this term, the maximum uncertainty. It's actually quite useful. The maximum uncertainty is simply half the range. Largest minus the smallest is the range divided by two. The maximum uncertainty is commonly reported in physics experiments, but maximum uncertainty is in fact the maximum uncertainty. We would prefer to report the most probable uncertainty, and that's given by the standard deviation. It says calculate the average and the maximum uncertainty. So I'm not going to spend much time with it, but let's quickly look at one. If we pick out the largest number as being 1.37, and the smallest is 1.30, then the max minus the min, you would agree, is has a range equal to 0 0.07. And so half the range is the maximum uncertainty. Zero point zero seven divided by two, zero point zero three five rounds to zero point zero four. The maximum uncertainty is a legitimate measure of precision. It's good. But a better indicator is a standard deviation, which is not the maximum uncertainty, but it's the most probable uncertainty. Here's another problem. During her shift, a chemist measured 10 viscosity readings on a large sample of an aqueous solution of glycerol. Units of viscosity are typically in something like centipoise. So here are those 10 readings. Use the data to calculate the mean. Now, I won't take the time to write it out for you, but I'll stop and explain as we go here. You can determine the mean is 65.7. The range will be the highest minus the lowest is 1.8. The maximum uncertainty is, of course, half the range, or 0.9. When you calculate the standard deviation, you'll see that it's 0 0.53. Now, what's going on here? Why do I have the 3 subscripted? Do you recall in your self-study units on uncertainties that when you take measurements, you are allowed to report all the digits you know for sure plus one uncertain digit. Only one. Well, standard deviation is an uncertain digit. You are only allowed to report one significant figure in a standard deviation because it's uncertain. Anything after that is an uncertainty on an uncertainty. It has no significance. So here, let me change color. Report one sig fig in any standard deviation. If a second sig fig is reported, it should be deprecated. That is, it's subscripted or underlined. And that's what I've done here. So what's it used for then? Well, if you want to take the standard deviation and calculate an expanded deviation, say you want to calculate 
the margin of error not at the 68 percent level but at the 95 percent level then you know that you take the standard deviation and multiply it by the appropriate factor either a z factor or a t factor if it's a z factor because you have many samples you multiply by 1.96 and that's where you'd keep the point 0.3 to use it in the calculation but after you've calculated you still have to round to only one decimal point as these are rounded to likewise if you want to calculate the margin of error at the 99.7 percent confidence level if it's a z factor it'd be three sigma three standard deviations three times this number so you use the three in the calculation and then discard it in the final answer so most important here please note the reported result here's the result must have the same precision as the standard deviation in our example our standard deviation its first significant figure is in the first decimal place and therefore your result can only be reported to the first decimal place. The precision of the standard deviation determines the precision of the result. They must match. Here's another example. Let's say the standard deviation on some calculation is 1.3. 0.3 is deprecated. So the uncertainty is in the ones column the first significant digit is in the ones column so you would have to report your result in the ones column and let's just make up a number let's say the number was 365 so 5 is in the ones column and that's the precision that you can report in your result and it must match the precision of the standard deviation you could not report 365.4 or any other decimal if in fact the standard deviation of the result its first significant figure is in the ones column Furthermore, if you report the standard deviation, be sure to report the number of replicates n. Why? Well, then the reader can use that to calculate the coefficient of variance or margin of error. If you then calculate the margin of error, you must report this to one sig fig and report the result to the same precision as the margin of error. Students have a tendency to copy down many decimal places from a calculator, thinking that that would give them greater precision. It isn't the case only one significant figure in a standard deviation and the precision of the result must match the precision of the standard deviation.